Marla Beauchamp, who is a physical therapist and assistant professor, soon to be associate starting July 1, uh, in the School of Rehabilitation Science and Department of Medicine at McMaster University. She holds a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair and an Early Researcher Award from the Ontario Ministry of Colleges and Universities in Technology and Aging. Dr. Beauchamp's research program is focused on developing evidence-based strategies to improve mobility among older adults and those with chronic diseases. Her ongoing research includes a multi-site longitudinal cohort study on long-term outcomes after COVID-19. So it's, it's great to be here today, and especially um, to be here with Jonathan, um, who was, yes, my postdoc mentor. And I think a lot of my grad students are laughing because they're seeing a lot of uh, similarities uh, in how we conceptualize things. Um, so I'm, you know, Jonathan started by talking about the importance of mobility and, and rehab and, you know, physical function as a vital sign. And so now I'll uh, talk to you about how that kind of applies when we look at COVID-19. So I'll talk to you about um, mobility after hospitalization for COVID-19, uh, what mobility looks like in the community, um, regard, uh, where the majority of patients were not hospitalized, and then some implications for rehabilitation. So this was a meta-analysis that's probably been updated, has been updated um, since 2021, but I like it because it shows you all the different body systems that have been um, impacted by COVID-19. Um, in this study, uh, this was a meta-analysis, and they found about 80% of patients had um, one or more long-term symptoms after their COVID-19, and they documented 55 different um, effects of, of uh, COVID. The most common in this meta-analysis, which did include sort of a mix of patients, um, were fatigue, headache, attention disorder, hair loss, and dyspnea. So what do we mean by post-COVID condition? Um, and this, is, this has kind of been an area that uh, is really a moving target. So, it's, the term post-COVID condition is sort of an umbrella term. It's been adopted by many major organizations, and it's meant to sort of encompass the wide range of different health effects that can uh, be caused uh, after COVID. So it includes things like new and persisting uh, symptoms, the most common being fatigue, dyspnea, and brain fog, um, multi-organ effects of COVID-19, which have been documented in most, if not all, body systems, um, and then, of course, the effects of COVID-19 treatment or hospitalization itself. So uh, patients um, with post-intensive care syndrome um, and post-traumatic stress disorder is also included here. So the World Health Organization, um, so th because of lack of consensus on what the definition of, of post-COVID was, um, and, and I should say post-COVID, also called um, long COVID, long haulers, um, or PASC, post-acute sequelae of um, SARS-CoV-2 infection, lots of different names, but they basically released this case definition, and I kind of like it because it's the most comprehensive one um, that's out there. It says that post-COVID conditions occur in ind individuals with probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually three months from the onset of COVID-19, with symptoms that last for at least two months and cannot be explained uh, by an alternative diagnosis. They say the most common symptoms include fatigue, shortness of breath, and cognitive dysfunction, but also others, and that these symptoms have um, an impact on everyday functioning. They also acknowledge that symptoms can be new onset, um, they can persist, or they can fluctuate and relapse over time. So I think that definition really does a good job at um, reflecting the complexity of, of post-COVID and, and long COVID. So a lot of research has been done on symptoms and, and how long do symptoms persist, but um, a lot less research has been paid to looking at functional recovery and functional status. And, um, and as Jonathan pointed out in his talk, we know that functional status is an incredibly powerful predictor of, of health outcomes and is incredibly important to patients. So what does it look like after hospitalization for COVID-19? So early on in the pandemic, we started a, a, 
a longitudinal cohort study with, uh, with five hospitals in uh, Hamilton and Kitchener Waterloo. And it was based on a registry project called Courage. Um, and it's a registry that we started, I don't know if Andrew Costa's here, um, but he was the lead on this. And uh, we started this registry very early in the pandemic in order to capture detailed medical information on all lab confirmed uh, COVID-19 cases. And we did this in collaboration with the uh, WHO um, ISRIC platform. And it became clear to us really early on that besides capturing information on the acute phase of illness that we needed to start looking at long-term effects. So we added this prospective uh, cohort study extension to Courage. Um, and so we recruited patients essentially on admission to the hospital ward um, and they did a telephone interview, a telephone interview on discharge. And then we had three, six, nine, and 12 months of follow-up. And we did that um, using a combination of phone interviews and home visits. We also, because we started in July 2020, we had missed some patients that had already been discharged. And so we could still go back and recruit those patients. And they entered the study at their closest possible um, follow-up. So this is a, just a list of all the different study measures and time points. And you can see we get information from a variety of sources, from the Courage Registry, from the phone interviews, and from the home visits. Today, um, given our focus on mobility, I'm going to focus on the AMPAC mobility scale, which was our primary outcome measure. Um, and it's a measure I really like. It's, the, it's called the Activity Measure for Post-Acute Care. And it uh, measures... Um, patient reported difficulty in doing 18 different tasks. And the really nice thing about it is it's designed specifically to look at mobility across transitions in care. So um, you, you can start looking in acute care and then and it's completely relevant. Uh, scores are then obtained for um, out when, once patients are back at home and can be compared. Um, and then uh, the physical performance test that we had, uh, Jonathan already talked about, short physical performance. Uh, battery. So I'll just go through those results today. So uh, the study is done recruiting. So these are the 282 uh, people um, that are in the study. We had a mean age of 60 years, minimum 19, max 93. Um, the majority of patients had um, uh, well, no, not majority, sorry, 40% of patients had uh, more than three uh, comorbidities. And in terms of in-hospital uh, characteristics, length of hospital stay was around 14 days, um, and uh, with, with a lot of variability around that, admission to the ICU was about 34%. So these are the, the, the symptoms um, that we collected on admission discharge, on admission uh, three months, six months, nine months, and uh, 12 months. And you can see on admission, which is that sort of first column, um, fatigue, dyspnea, and walking long distances were the most commonly um, endorsed symptoms. Um, and so quite high, right? 78%, 73%, 70%. Um, then as we go to 12 months, I can't quite read it, at, at, when we go to 12 months, um, the same issues um, are, are also, uh, the same symptoms are also endorsed um, with fatigue uh, reported by 48% of patients, uh, dyspnea by 32% and walking long distances by 38%. And so that's still quite a high load of deficits um, that we're seeing even at 12 months after a uh, resolution of, of COVID. So are these um, deficits, um, you know, what's the impact on functional mobility? So focusing just on the first panel, because we'll just focus on mobility, um, you can see here this is results of a repeated measures ANOVA, and, and what you can see is that if we compare different time points for mobility, um, we can see that if we compare to pre-morbid status, so where patients were before they got sick, um, and we compare them to where they were at three months, six months, nine months, and 12 months, they're significantly worse at all those time points. And then um, when we look at the data between three and uh, 12 months follow-up, we're not seeing a, a whole lot of change. 
And, um, and then if we take this concept of clinically meaningful difference, so now we think how many people have a deficit compared to their baseline that is, exceeds what we know to be the minimal clinically important difference on this scale, we actually see that by, at 12 months, um, you know, 57% of patients still have mobility deficits that are clinically important. Um, the same applied for cognition and, um, and then uh, um, uh, daily activities as well with slightly different numbers. So now if we go to physical performance and we look at results from the short physical performance battery, um, here we can see, if you remember that magic number of 10, um, you want to be, um, uh, it, so scores of, of less than 10 indicate higher risk of mobility disability. And, and across the board, you know, even by 12 months, you still have 54% um, or no, sorry, 65% of the sample reporting um, having physical function deficits that put them at high risk of, of a number of different adverse outcomes. So uh, we also looked at factors that predict mobility recovery. Um, and so just as a busy slide, I know, so if we just focus on the bottom regression model, um, we can see first that pre-morbid mobility, so how, what your functional status was before you got sick, that predicted most of your um, functional recovery at 12 months. And that's not surprising, but what's the unique thing that we actually have this data in the study, as a lot of, a lot of studies don't have that data. So 65% of the variation in function at 12 months is explained by, pre, by functional status uh, at, before patients got sick. But also, being male, being younger, having fewer comorbidities, um, and being hospitalized during the second wave of the pandemic also contributed to this model. Um, and so this gives us a really a good sense, a preliminary sense. This is uh, data based on just waves one and two um, of what some risk factors might be for development of, of these long-term outcomes. So what about non-hospitalized uh, people that get COVID-19? Um, so we did this, we had the opportunity to do this analysis in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging because they completed um, a COVID survey. It was launched in the um, first wave of the pandemic. And uh, we had data on over 24,000 people. And the really amazing thing about this is that because it was part of this population-based um, cohort study, we have this, we have a built-in comparison group, um, which a lot of studies don't have. So we had some physical function items from the first wave of follow-up in the CLSA where patients are asked about difficulty standing up from a chair, walking two to three blocks and climbing stairs. And, um, and we had that from the first follow-up of the CLSA. So that was conducted a couple of years before um, COVID hit. And then we have global rating of change and mobility question. And anyone that knows me knows I love these questions. But it just asks um, participants to rate their ability to um, move around in the home, um, their ability to engage in housework, ability to engage in physical activity. And they rate um, their difficulty level, that their change in those things um, from much worse to much better on a five-point scale. And what we found is that in individuals uh, that had um, probable or confirmed COVID-19, and we did this based on definitions consistent with um, PHAC and the CDC at the time of data collection, um, these indiv individuals had a twofold uh, higher odds of worsening housework activity and physical activity. They also reported new difficulty standing up after sitting in a chair. And these results held even if we looked at the suspected COVID-19 cases. So these are people that would have been exposed to someone with COVID-19, had symptoms of COVID-19, but didn't um, necessarily receive a diagnosis. Um, so these um, suspected COVID-19 uh, uh, participants um, had deficits in almost all of the mobility domains. And like I said, this is above and beyond background levels because the our comparator group are people living in the community during the same time and, and subject to all the same um, public health restrictions. So what can we do about it? 
Well, good news is there's lots that we can do to, to help these um, patients. And we, um, the Canadian Thoracic Society, um, released a, a statement on um, uh, best practices for rehabilitation for COVID-19 and, and some of the implications for pulmonary rehab. Um, and most, most major health organizations now really endorse rehab as a strategy for these patients. And um, in, mo in all of the guidelines, an assessment at six to eight weeks after the resolution of acute COVID um, is recommended. And um, in our guideline, we stated that all patients with COVID-19 should be assessed for uh, persistent and new or new symptoms and functional limitations uh, six to eight weeks after their acute infection. And this includes people whose initial disease was mild. And then because there was a big call for pulmonary rehab for these patients because of some of their symptoms of dyspnea, exercise intolerance, and cough, um, there, we had to have specific criteria around who would most benefit. Um, and so um, people that should be referred to pulmonary rehab they should really have respiratory symptoms, a need for supplemental ox oxygen, and some evidence of pulmonary impairment. Um, and just some general considerations for rehab for these patients. The, the big thing is conservative progression and symptom monitoring um, because these patients do experience what's called post-exertional malaise, which is um, a physical and mental activity-induced, uh, activity-induced physical and mental fatigue. Um, and so it's really important, especially we want to get them to buy in and to, and to stay, stay the course with our rehabilitation programs that we don't push too hard and that we, we, we manage this as we go. Um, the other thing is having education really specific to the challenges faced by people with COVID-19, so issues around fatigue, sleep and mood, um, cognitive problems, and return to work. Um, and obviously a huge need for a multidisciplinary team. In terms of evidence, evidence for rehabilitation in these patients is emerging, but it's still limited, um, and, and, and there are issues with quality. But it, it, more, more is coming. So just to conclude, um, I th hope I've shown you that I think COVID-19 has had a detrimental effect on mobility across the spectrum of illness. Um, we need more investment in rehab to support our existing patients and uh, patients that are dealing with post-COVID conditions. Um, for example, pulmonary rehabilitation for people with chronic lung disease, access to pulmonary rehabilitation is only 2%. Um, so if, if you think about then referring all your post-COVID patients to pulmonary rehabilitation, then, then your regular patients have nowhere to go. So we do need to ramp up these services. And then we also need to um, look into virtual programs and post-infectious disease care pathways, not just for COVID, but for other types of infectious diseases that impact um, older people, um, and figure out how we can also reach some of the vulnerable groups, the people that have been affected by COVID, because they're not, they may not be um, able to access rehabilitation in the, in the usual way. So, um, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge um, the teams that do this incredible work, like um, Andrew Costa, Mylin Duong, Rebecca Kresselbrink, Terence Hope, Harman Dorena, who are co-PIs on um, our, our functional recovery study, um, and all of our funders, patient partners, and the other um, expert panel members on the CTS uh, guidance statement. Thank you very much. Thank you.